for the invitation to be with you. It was extended to me by the elders here and Brother Kenny at his recommendation. I thank you so much. It has been a blessing these past few days to be with you. You've been so encouraging and supportive of the lessons that I've brought to you and shared with you. And it has been a blessing for me to get to know you, and it has been a blessing for me to hear these other men. Uh, I live in the same town with Brother Bob Owen, but I never get to hear him speak, and so it's been delightful to me to hear him speak. Uh, I was telling David Banning the other day I couldn't remember the last time I got to hear him preach. Our ways have kind of separated over the years, and we've been in different places, uh, but it's been good to hear him. And I've never heard Brother Randy Harshbarger speak, and I've appreciated so much the way that all of these men have been handling the text, and their very methodical and insightful ways. And so I'm, I'm delighted to be here today, uh, not only to share this message with you, but uh, to experience with you the good teaching of these men. If you have your Bible and would turn to the Old Testament, to the book of Habakkuk, we're going to look at the message of salvation and what Habakkuk has to say about that. It was a long, long time ago, somewhere in the 600s B.C. Most students of the Old Testament would say it would probably be the late 600s, probably somewhere around 609 B.C. if we had to pinpoint it uh, to the best of our ability. Habakkuk preached in a very difficult time in the history of Israel. And to give you a sense of the days in which he lived, he was probably a contemporary of the prophet Jeremiah. He was probably also a contemporary of the prophet Nahum and the prophet Zephaniah. Most students of the Old Testament who have studied Habakkuk would say that it is probably a good guess that Habakkuk preached during the time of King Jehoiakim of Judah. And if your Old Testament history is a little rusty, I would have you to remember that it is King Jehoiakim who refused to listen to the preaching of Jeremiah the prophet. We're told in Jeremiah chapter 36 that Jeremiah had been preaching for about 23 years. And he had a scribe, sort of a secretary, a fellow that worked with him whose name was Baruch. And Baruch would go around with Jeremiah, and he would write down in a book the things that Jeremiah had preached. Probably not a, a word-for-word -word transcript of, Isaiah's, uh, of Jeremiah's preaching, but probably very detailed notes and catching the points of what Jeremiah had said. And that book was taken and given to the officials of the king for them to read. Because Jeremiah said, this is something that you folks need to know about. Jeremiah was preaching that God was going to destroy the city of Jerusalem. And so that book was given to the officials of the king, and they read it, and they said, oh my goodness, this is something. The king needs to see this. And so they took it to King Jehoiakim, and they began to read the scroll that Baruch had written containing the points that Jeremiah had been preaching about and after they had read a couple columns of that scroll, the Bible says that Jehoiakim took out a knife, cut the scroll into pieces, and threw the scroll into the fireplace. That's the context in which Habakkuk preached. And if you've ever read the book of Habakkuk, you know that it's an unusual kind of book. If you open the book of Jeremiah, what you find are page after page after page of what Jeremiah said, what God spoke through him to the people of his day. And the same is true with Isaiah and Hosea and those other texts. But when you get to the book of Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk is basically a conversation between God and the prophet. There's a little preaching, there is a little rebuke in the words of God in response to Habakkuk, but the format of the book of Habakkuk is that Habakkuk has some questions for God that he wants God to answer. It is not too dissimilar to the book of Job in that regard, and the subject matter is even a little bit similar. 
What does this unusual book of the Old Testament therefore have to say? A book that was written in such a distant time in a distant place in a situation that you and I have never experienced physically. What could this book of the Bible have to say to us? Well, if you would begin in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 1. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. And you'll notice how the book begins. It begins in earnest. How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld for the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. And it's not hard to see what Habakkuk is getting at there. He says, God, when are you going to do something about this? I'm down here preaching your will. I'm trying to get these people to repent, and nobody is listening. But it's even worse than that. It's not just that nobody's listening. These people are given over to wickedness. The only thing that I get to see and experience from day to day is violence and destruction and the perversion of justice. It's like my words are having no effect whatsoever. And I'm preaching till I'm blue in the face, Habakkuk says, and nothing is changing. If anything, the situation is getting worse, and God, you're doing nothing about it. And Habakkuk loves justice. He's concerned about what is right. And God's delay in acting is causing concern to this prophet. He's beginning to wonder, God, is something wrong with you? Are you going to tolerate this wickedness? Is that the kind of God you're going to show yourself to be? A God that doesn't care about all of this evil that's going on? Why aren't you doing something about it, God? And so in verse 5, God gives Habakkuk his first answer. He says, Habakkuk, look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder. Because I am doing something in your days. And we're going to stop right there. I am doing something about it. And the first thing I'd like for you to think about the book of Habakkuk with me today is this message that God is in control. What God is saying to the prophet is you think that everything has gone haywire. You think that I don't see or that I don't care. But Habakkuk, the fact is that I do see, I do care, and I am doing something about it. As a matter of fact, what I am doing about it is already in the works. If you will lift your eyes and look at the nations, look at the international scene of your day, look at what the nations of the earth are up to, you'll see what I'm doing because I am using them to to address this situation. I have a plan, Habakkuk, and I am working that plan according to my will. And one of the things God is trying to do is get Habakkuk to kind of open his eyes. Habakkuk, I think, is a lot like us sometimes. When we've got a problem, we want God to do something about it now. We want him to work on it right here in a way that is obvious to us. And God says, well, that's not how this is working right now. It's not that I'm being inactive. It's just that you're not looking at the right place. I don't know if Habakkuk wanted God to to throw down thunder and lightning from heaven and destroy the wicked. I don't know if he wanted to speak to them out of the sky. But God says, that's not what I'm doing. But I am taking care of the situation. Over and over in the Bible, we get this message that God is the creator In Hebrews chapter 1 and in verse 3, speaking of Jesus, he is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact representation of his nature, and he upholds all things by the word of his power. The point is that the Lord is in control. In Colossians chapter 1 and in verse 17, Paul says this about Jesus that he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, has his hand on the situation. There is never a moment in which Jesus takes a break, which he is unconcerned about the way things are going with this world. Paul says that all things hold together in him. And that's not just a New Testament message. Do you remember back in 1 Kings chapter 22? It's one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. King Ahab wanted to go and take the city of Ramoth Gilead. Ramoth Gilead was a border town. It was right on the border between Israel and Syria. And Israel had been in decline for a while, and, and the Syrians had taken that city away from the Israelites, and Ahab said, you know, that's our city, and I want it back, and I'm going to go fight the Syrians and get it back. But the problem Ahab had was that he didn't have a big enough army to fight the Syrians. And so you remember he invited King Jehoshaphat from Judah to bring his army up, and together they would go and, and fight the Syrians. But Jehoshaphat said, you know what, uh, Ahab, it is my practice that before I ever do anything like this, I consult God about it. So do you have a prophet around here? Do you remember that story? And Ahab says, oh, man, we got more prophets around here than you can shake a stick at. I got prophets of Baal all over the place. And you remember that Jehoshaphat said, no, not one of those. I was wondering if you have a prophet of Yahweh, a prophet of God around here. And oh, Ahab said, yeah, we got one of them too. He can never say anything nice about me. It's always, you're going to die, and God's going to get you, and, you know, I just can't stand the guy. And, and Jehoshaphat says, well, I really would like to hear from him. And so they bring Micaiah. And you remember that as they're bringing him up, the, the guy that had went to go fetch him said, now, Micaiah, can I give you a piece of advice? Try to say something nice to the king today, and don't, don't get him angry. And Micaiah said, let's get something straight, and let's get it straight right now. I'm going to say what God wants said. And that's exactly what he did. Ahab says, okay, Micaiah, tell us, shall, shall we go up to Ramoth Gilead and succeed? And Micaiah said, go. He says, it's going to be fine. Go. And Ahab knew that Micaiah was toying with him. And then Micaiah said, you want to know the truth, Ahab? Let me tell you what I saw the other day. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all around him was his heavenly court. Court was in session. God had all of his heavenly advisors with him, and God posed the question to them, how am I going to kill Ahab? And the response was given by one of his servants that I'll go and trick him into thinking that he can win at Ramoth Gilead and he'll go and he'll get killed. And that is exactly what happened. You read the rest of that story. The time of Ahab and Jezebel was a time of great wickedness. But Micaiah's message is, you think you've got the upper hand, Ahab. You think you're the king around here, but I'm here to tell you that you're going to die when you go to Ramoth Gilead. Because God is in control. You remember Isaiah? The book of Isaiah starts with a kind of a preliminary round of Isaiah's preaching to kind of set the tone and to get the basic message out there. But the story of Isaiah himself kind of starts in Isaiah chapter 6. And Isaiah says, in the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord in his holy temple and his train, the train of his robe, filled the temple. And the seraphim were flying in heaven and covering their faces saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Why does Isaiah's life as a prophet begin that way? God was sending a message. He says, before you say too much, Isaiah, here's what I want you to know, that I am in control. I am on the throne. Revelation chapters 4 and 5, you've read that book. After the letters to the churches where John says, here's what you're going to have to get ready for. Here's what you're going to have to do if you're going to survive what's coming. How does the book of Revelation really start in Revelation 4? The throne scene. 
John has told them in chapters 1, 2, and 3 that there is a great tribulation on the horizon. It's going to get rough. You're going to get persecuted. Some of you are going to get killed. But know this, as it were, chapters 4 and 5, that God is on the throne and God is in control. Psalm 47 and verse 8, God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Psalm 82, arise, O God, and judge the earth, for it is you who possesses all the nations. Psalm 22, the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. And of course, who can forget Psalm 2, that messianic psalm that is the basis of the New Testament understanding of Jesus. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession and you shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall shatter them like earthenware. And that is the point that God is trying to get across to Habakkuk, that I am doing something. And it's just like Brother Harshbarger so eloquently said in his lesson right before this, that it is God's intention to fix the situation. It is God's intention to save his people. He is working on a plan. As Paul said there in Philippians 1 and verse 6, he has already begun this good work, and he's going to finish it one of these days. That's what he's trying to get across to Habakkuk here, that I'm doing something about it, and don't you think otherwise. We need to remember that no matter how difficult life seems, no matter what the world seems to be doing against us, We've got nothing to fear. Our God sits on the throne of the universe, and he is in control. But there is a second thing that I would point you to here in the book of Habakkuk. God says in verse 5, I'm doing something in your days. Habakkuk, you would not believe it if you were told. It's not often that God says that in the Bible. You're not going to believe this, Habakkuk. We'll come back to that in just a moment. But the point that God is making to Habakkuk is that what I'm going to do about this problem may be unusual, unexpected, and even strange to you, Habakkuk. He says in verse 6, I am raising up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence their, ho their horde of faces moves forward. They collect captives like sand. They mock at kings and rulers or a laughing matter to them. They laugh at every fortress. They heap up rubble to capture it. Then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on. And God says, that's what I'm going to do about it. I'm going to bring the Babylonians here, and I'm going to have those wicked, violent, power-hungry viol Babylonians come and deal a blow to my people. And Habakkuk says, well, now that can't be the answer. How can that be the answer? That doesn't make sense. Look in verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We won't die. And I think the, the author is saying that, is that what you're saying? You're going to come kill us all? Is that the message? Is that the answer to the problem? You, Lord, have appointed them to judge. And you, O Rock, have established them to correct but your eyes, verse 13, are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? This can't be the answer, God, that you're going to be on the side of the wicked against the people of your covenant, that you're going to give them strength, and you're going to empower those sinners, those pagans that don't even believe in you? How can that be the answer? Well, Habakkuk was learning something about God, something that Isaiah had tried to get across to the 
people of his day. In Isaiah chapter 55, you remember what God said? My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. I don't do things like you, and I don't think like you, God says. Over and over again, we see that God does not do what is expected from the human point of view. You remember the story of the Israelites in the Old Testament that God gave the promise to Abraham and he, he lived in the land of Canaan and so did Isaac and so did Jacob. And then Joseph finds his way down to Egypt because of the hatred of his brothers and a famine comes and those brothers have to go down and they meet with Joseph and Joseph says that the Lord has actually sent me here to preserve life for you and I want all of you folks to come down here and, and my family to live in Egypt where I can take care of you. And so the book of Genesis ends with God's people not even in the land. And then the book of Exodus says that the Pharaoh of Egypt became afraid of the Israelites because of their number, and the Israelites were enslaved by the Egyptians. And we look out and, and, at that and say, how can that be what God wanted? How, how, how does the plan of God work when he steers his people into slavery? Well, you and I have read the rest of the story, and you know as well as I do that there was a point to that. God had spoken to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob, but they really didn't know what kind of God that he was. They had no idea of, of what his power was like. And so what God did is he allowed his people to get into a situation of difficulty so that God would then show his power against their enemies and they would then know what kind of God they served. There was a point to it. Or you think about the conquest of Jericho. You know, in the ancient world, if you wanted to take a fortified city, what you had to do is you had to get an army and you had to surround that city. You had to establish a blockade so that no food could get in and no messages could get out. And what the people inside that city would have to do then is they would have to start rationing the food and water that they had. And, of course, as the days and weeks go on, they are eventually going to eat all the food in the city, and they're going to get to the point of starvation. Now, while the people are on the inside starving to death, your army on the outside is building ramps, you're building weapons, you're building siege engines and towers and things like that. And when the people on the inside are just about ready to drop dead because of starvation, then you attack the city. And you take it that way. And the process takes anywhere from 18 months to six years. And God brings the Israelites to Jericho and says, march around it once a day. On the seventh day, march around it seven times and blow trumpets. And that's all you need to do. And I'm sure the Israelites thought, that can't be the way to take a city. Nobody takes city. It, that, I don't understand that. That's exactly how it fell, though. Recall the walls of Jericho fell flat, not because they laid siege to the city, but because they followed God's way. But perhaps the greatest example in all the Bible of that which was unusual and unexpected was the death of the Messiah. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you remember that text where Paul is trying to get the Corinthians to to see exactly what it is the gospel's all about. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. In verse 23, we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. To Jews a stumbling block. Paul had the unpleasant task of going to synagogues and saying, I'm here to tell you, my fellow Jews, that you have misunderstood your own Bible. And that now I'm going to set you straight and tell you what it's all about. Here, is, here it is. Jesus of Nazareth, somebody you've never heard of, who got himself executed by the Romans, is the Messiah of Israel. I don't know what you think of when you hear the word crucifixion, but I think the closest thing that we have in modern uh, America to that is the electric chair. 
Imagine going around and saying, I've got a new philosophy. I've got a new way of, of life. I've got a new perspective on the world. You're going to love it. It came from a guy who died in an electric chair. And people would say, really? You got this from some convict? What would he know about what's good and right? That's the message of the gospel that Paul preached, that our Messiah got killed on a Roman cross, and the Jews said, not buying it. It doesn't make sense that that's the way it should be. And to the Gentiles, it was, a, it was foolishness, because if you lived in pagan society in the first century, there's one thing that you believed about the gods, and that is that a god is immortal. Gods don't die. And Paul said, well, my God did. The God that I serve died on a cross in Jerusalem. And the Gentiles said, that's, that's nonsense, Paul. Nobody saw that coming. You remember in Isaiah chapter 53, the story there of the suffering servant? You remember how it begins? Who has believed our report? The answer is nobody. This is the way it's going to be? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is, this is how it's going to happen by, by taking our king, our long-awaited prophet and Messiah, and killing him on a Roman cross? In Isaiah chapter 29 and verse 14, I will deal marvelously with this people, wondrously marvelous. And like God said to Habakkuk, you're not going to believe it. You know, the amazing thing is that God was exactly right about that. This message of the cross seemed unbelievable. And God said, I told you you wouldn't believe it, but that's what it is. It's the message about Jesus. And sometimes we look at things and we just don't see how can this ever be worked out. How can God be working in this? Because it doesn't fit our way of thinking and our patterns of thought. But I would have you remember Isaiah 55 and verse 8 where God says, Your ways are not my ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And so it was with Habakkuk that God was going to use the Babylonians and Habakkuk couldn't understand it. But he had to realize that this is the way God is going to work. You'll notice how it resumes in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 1. Habakkuk has responded to God. He has basically said, there is no way this can be the way you're going to fix the problem, God. This cannot be the answer. Look at the last verse in chapter 1. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? That You're going to just come and kill us all? And Habakkuk says in chapter 2 and verse 1, I'm going to stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart, and I'm going to keep watch and see what he will speak to me. In other words, I'm going to sit right here, and I'm not going to move until God gives me an answer to this question. Because I thought the problem was bad in, at the first, that God wasn't doing anything about wickedness, but the answer that God gave me is even worse than the problem, so I've really got to get this straightened out. And I'm going to sit right here and wait for it. In verse 2, the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets. God saying, you write this down, Habakkuk, that the one who reads it may run. This is the kind of message that when you hear it, you're going to throw the book down and say, i got to get out of here. And yes, Habakkuk, I am going to use the Babylonians to punish my people. For the vision is yet for the appointed time, verse 3. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. We saw that in our study last night of Abraham, right? It might not happen tomorrow or next week, but it's coming. Wait for it. For it will certainly come and it will not delay. But God says in verse 4, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous one, the righteous will live by his faith. And that's the third lesson that I would share with you this morning from the book of Habakkuk. That God is looking for people of faith. 
God's message to Habakkuk is, no, Habakkuk, I'm not going to kill them all. The proud ones, they're going to get what's coming to them. But those who have faith, they're going to survive this. You remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Where God said, I'm going to destroy those cities, and, and God was asked by Abraham, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? And God's answer was consistently, no, I will not. And if you can find just as few as ten righteous people in that city, I'll spare it. And even when God destroyed the city, he did not destroy Lot with it. God does not punish indiscriminately. His wrath does not just come. You know, Brother Randy mentioned a, a moment ago the book by J.B. Phillips, Your God is Too Small. And one of the pictures in that book is of this mean old man sitting up in heaven with this evil grin on his face, waiting for an excuse to zap people. Some people think of God like that. But God says, that's not who I am. Oh, I'll punish the wicked, but the righteous will survive. It's already been mentioned in our lectureship that this passage is quoted three times in the New Testament. Paul quotes it in Romans chapter 1. He quotes it again in Galatians chapter 3. And the author of Hebrews quotes it in Hebrews chapter 10. Those biblical authors kept coming back to this passage. And they said, if you want to know what's going on, it's right there in Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. I want you to think about the situation of Habakkuk's day. Israel was filled with wickedness. God had promised to destroy it. A day of destruction and vengeance was coming. And the prophets were preaching the warning. And God said, if you want to survive this, you had better be a person of faith. Brethren, I submit to you that the reason the Apostle Paul and the author of the book of Hebrews quoted that verse is because they understood that you and I are exactly in that position today. We are living in a world that is filled with sin. We are living in a world that is slated for destruction. God has already promised in his world that he's going to destroy this place that the day is coming in which he is going to send his wrath upon the unbelievers and those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, as he said to the Thessalonians. He's going to punish the wicked and do away with this world of sin and death, but he's not going to do so indiscriminately. He's going to save those who have faith. And that's why the New Testament authors keep quoting this verse. Don't you see? that we're in that same situation, that what Habakkuk was in was a type, it was an example, it was an illustration of the situation that we are in, in the Messianic age, and that it has come to its fullness now in the situation created by Jesus. As Paul said to the Athenians in Acts 17, God has appointed day, a, a day in which he will judge the world by the man whom he has appointed, Jesus Christ. We live in the last days. We live in the time in which judgment is coming. And Habakkuk's situation was a model of ours. And it's a model of how God deals with human sin and what he's going to do. That's why Jesus told the Jews of his day, this is the work of God in John 6, a text that David addressed the other day. This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. As I mentioned last night, that's what God's always been looking for from the time of Adam until now. He wants people of faith. Like Paul said in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, By grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God. God is looking for people of faith. Therein lies the message of salvation. If you will be a believer in Jesus. It may be that there are some here this morning that are not believers in Jesus. We hope that you would become one, and we can help you to do that right now if that be your desire. Maybe you're a believer in Jesus and your faith has waned in some way, and you need the prayers of this group, or you need to 
to, to acknowledge some error in your life and ask for help. If we can help you to do that, I would have you to know that the message of Habakkuk is just as relevant today as it was 2,600 years ago. Become a person of faith today. You need to do that. Won't you come as we stand and sing this song together? Oh, wow.